Okay, I want to welcome you all to um, a, a new topic for our chapter on risk management, and we're very excited to bring this topic to you, and I'm sure that you're going to walk away with a lot of great and useful information. So as we get going, I just want to tell you a little bit about SCORE, just in case you're not familiar. Uh, there's three things that uh, we do that are really that's really important. Uh, one is providing you with information. Uh, that information um, in can, comes to you in different ways. One is through our website where you can um, download um, templates, you can watch videos, you can read articles, uh, all kinds of information for you to access on there. And I strongly encourage you to take a look through. Uh, the templates aren't just business plans. There's marketing plans and cash flow and budgeting and all kinds of great tools for you to use, um, of course, free of charge. The other thing that we offer is the training. Uh, you're here today, webinars and workshops, um, some in person, person mostly uh, they are online. Uh, you will get um, newsletters occasionally, so please watch for those to um, see what we have coming up next. Um, the other important thing that we do, and probably the most important thing we do, is the, the our mentoring. If you go to the next screen there, Bill. Uh, our mentoring is free and confidential. Our mentors come to us with a variety of skills and experiences that they want to share with the small business community. We work with folks that are in that beginning stage. They're trying to decide if small business is right for them. We're working with those that are in the planning phase. They're, they're deep into that business plan and putting together their budgets and we're there to support them through that process. And we're working with those that are already in business. Um, maybe they're you're looking to grow or you're struggling with your financial reports or you want to help with a market marketing plan. Uh, we have mentors uh, from in within our own chapter or our district, or we can reach out to the national level to get somebody to help you with the questions and concerns that you might have. Uh, a first session, if you've not met with a SCORE uh, mentor before, is going to be a get to know you. They want to know what your goals are, what your challenges are, and they're going to help you formulate a plan to accomplish those goals and to overcome those challenges. And our mentors, they work as a group. Uh, you're not, you're not, you're not just getting the brain power of one person. You're getting the brain power of the group as a collective. Uh, they will reach out to each other to bring in, you know, different experts and and different uh, skill sets as needed to keep you going forward. Uh, next slide. So getting that mentor is super, super easy. You can use that QR code and scan it to get to the, the registration page, or you can just go to the score.org website. There's a blue box, put your zip code in, and that will match you to the chapter that's nearest you. Uh, then they're going to ask you a couple quick questions, and that information allows that chapter to match you to the appropriate mentor for your situation. Uh, next page. And today we are going to go ahead and use that Q&A button on your Zoom bar, and that will be to submit questions to our presenter as we work our way through. And I'll read those questions out loud as appropriate to get your questions answered. Uh, everything else can go into chat. We are recording and you will be able to find it on the score.org slash Boston website. Uh, you can see there from the graphic, it'll be under the local workshops tab on the blue bar and you'll find it under previously recorded webinars. Um, give me at least 24 to 48 hours to get that posted for you, but that's where you're gonna find it. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to our presenter today. Uh, Bill, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Teresa, thanks for bringing this together and everybody welcome. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm a lawyer. I've been in practice oof, a long time now, let's say. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs here in Boston. And let me emphasize uh, something that Teresa said, which is please don't hesitate to come to us at any stage of the process. But particularly when you're in the thinking and vision and dreaming stage, it's it's often sad to see somebody who's invested in websites or things like that before they have a good business plan in mind. And, you know, typically your business plan is going to inform the structure of your website or your entity choice or how you're going to capitalize yourself and so on. So you, from our perspective, you are most welcome to come 
as soon as you have an idea that you want to to talk about. So today I had talked to Teresa and, you know, because I'm a lawyer, I see a lot of um, issues from clients uh, about legal issues, how to manage risk in the context, you know, to prevent risk basically. And then some basic ideas about what happens when you and the other side of an agreement you have, either a client or a, a, a vendor to you can't agree. So I thought I would offer this to you as, as an overview really of that, of that process. Now, obviously this is just an overview. So we really can't promise you that you're going to get, oh, oh no, no, I'm not going to be able to back up, but that's all right. Um, I can't promise you that I, I'm going to cover every detail and that's why you'll be able to contact me or some of my colleagues, depending on, you know, what your specific needs might be for your company. We can't serve as your lawyer, but we find we can typically help people understand uh, what possible solutions to a legal issue might be, certainly to talk about how we can improve your uh, your three-legged stool that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So um, come to us at any time. Uh, don't hesitate at all. And uh Again, if, if, if we can't help you because we can't be your lawyer, we can make referrals to uh, either fee-based lawyers or sometimes pro bono lawyers through the legal clinics and so on. So today, I, I want to start by giving you kind of a structural uh, view to help you think about risk management. And I use the, the metaphor of a three-legged stool. So the... Um, if you, if you have all three of these legs in place, you've got a stable platform to manage your business risk. And managing business risk is actually managing risk to your business assets, your money, your reputation, your relationships with clients, and so on. And of course, your personal assets. So the more stability means the less risk. And the fewer of these legs you have, the more risk you're taking on. Now, obviously, some businesses carry more risk than others. If you're a, a translator, that may be less risk than if you're serving as a coach. And we need to make sure that you're not providing uh, therapeutic services or you're publishing things and you may have intellectual property risk and so on. So that's a fourth element, but we're not really going to talk too much about that. But the three legs of my stool, if you think about it that way, are your entity formation. Are you going to be an LLC? Are you going to be a sole proprietor? Do you have insurance in place where you pay to lay some of that risk off on, on your insurer? And then finally, one that um, we'll get a little further into the weeds on, which is contract terms that you should understand and certainly consider having in your agreements with your clients or agreements with your people that are providing goods and services to you. So the first leg of the stool really is, are you going to have an entity? Uh, because you're small businesses and it's not free to form an entity, we meet a lot of people and particularly in the, <coughs> excuse me, the early stages of their business who are just operating as a solo entrepreneur. They don't have an entity and so on. And depending on the nature of the business, um, maybe that's not a big deal. There's not a lot of inherent risk in the work that they're doing. But as you grow in size and scale, and you certainly, if you're, <laughs> excuse me, doing something that has some risk associated with it, um, you know, if you're in the building trades, for example, if you're providing uh, services, personal services like massage or hair care, things like that, you know, there's if you're dealing with children, there are risks involved there. And so the benefit to having a legal entity, an LLC, a corporation, is that you limit the risk of the operation of the business to the assets of the company. <laughs> excuse me, or put another way, if you don't have that, then your personal assets are at risk. So if you own a home, subject to a Homestead Act, maybe, but, you know, the assets of your family, your assets of your business account are all in play if you haven't 
stuck that barrier of the legal entity uh, between you and anybody that might sue you. And I, I think Teresa will confirm we have an excellent workshop that we offer on in more depth about legal entities you may want to watch or attend when it's available to talk in more detail about that. But today, I just want to give you a general overview about two of the most common ones that most people uh, need. And the first one is obviously the limited liability company. Um, the rules may be slightly different in each state and the fees may be different, but generally they're all the same. And what I'm going to talk to you about is, is how they apply pretty much in Massachusetts. So if, if you're at a stage where you don't have an entity yet, and you want to think about how to do that, I've included here a great explainer that comes from nolo.com, which is one of these online legal, um, you know, legal service providers. It, it, but it, it does a great job of explaining it specifically for Massachusetts. It's a step-by-step. -step. It has all the links to where you need to go. You don't need to hire Nolo to do this. Uh, we can help you if you have any questions. But I'm sure I've referred over 100 people to Nolo, and maybe three of them have come back and said, oh, I have a question about something. So again, it's, it's the most cost-effective way. The filing to the state is an annual filing of about $500 a year. I don't keep up on the fees. And one benefit to the LLC, we're not going to get too far. This would be in the other workshop is that there's no taxation at the level of the LLC. So every uh, all the earnings and revenue of the company minus your business deductions are uh, created in a Schedule C or a Schedule K-1 if there's more than one member, but there's no tax there and then you're taxed at your individual level going down. So that's that's a pretty simple and efficient way to create that first leg of the stool and start limiting your risk by limiting the amount of personal exposure uh, you, you can have because of the, uh, the operation of the business. So the C corporation has very similar uh, uh, protection for the owners of the business. There are some benefits to the C corp in terms of being able to issue shares as a way to capitalize your company and so on. But, a disadvantage to the C-Corp is that you're taxed twice. The C-Corp is, is recognized as an entity, and so it gets taxed, and then distributions uh, to shareholders or uh, salary to uh, corporate uh, employees or vendors is also going to be taxed there. So it's it's less efficient from a tax perspective, but it's it's another alternative, again, particularly what we like to tell people as part of there is don't form your entity until you've done your business plan because a critical distinction between the LLC and the C Corp is how you're going to capitalize your, your business. If you're going to fund it with your own money, the LLC is by far the best way to go. Uh, but if you're going to ask people who to, fund you, but you don't want them involved in the management of the company, you know, issuing shares might be a better way to go. And certainly if you're looking at venture money or money from angel uh, investors or so on, they're probably going to want to see a C corporation structure because they're going to want to own those, those shares. But again, today we're focusing primarily on liability. Any questions there before I move on to insurance? Uh, no questions yet. Okay, just a couple chats. Okay, so insurance protects you in two ways. And whether in almost all cases, if you're doing, if this is your business, if you're, if this is what you do all day, you should have insurance, even if you don't create an entity. And the, the basic reason for insurance, there are two. One is, They'll pay, pay for your claims of defense. So even if you're right, ultimately, you have to pay to prove that you're right. So if you get sued, um, the insurance company will respond there. And the, the second reason is, is that it will uh, 
insure you against claims uh, that you you pay for, obviously. But even if it turns out you were wrong in certain respects, the insurance company will will step in and and uh, resolve those claims on your behalf, s- subject to certain uh, restrictions or limits. And those limits are first, how much insurance did you buy? Uh, you know, insurance is has two basic components. One is how much risk have you bought? And the second part is what you probably know of as your deductible, which is actually the, the risk that you're retaining. So if you have a million dollar policy and a $10,000 deductible, that means the first $10,000 of the what would otherwise be covered by the insurance company, um, you're going to pay for out of pocket. So when you are uh, negotiating with an insurance broker or an online company or what have you, you typically want to ask, um, think about how much retained risk or deductible you can afford and what's a realistic number uh, for the absolute amount of insurance that you need. Again, if you're if you're uh, a chiropractor or somebody who's dealing with people, dealing with children, you know, the likelihood of risk is small, but the impact of somebody making a claim can be large, improper touching or certainly anything that is alleged to be an improper uh, interaction with a child. And, you know, the same is for a lot of uh, professions that you may be in. So give a thought of what your risk is. And (laughs) pardon me, when you apply for the insurance, an underwriter, which is a person who assigns the level of risk, if you will, and then the amount of money you're going to have to pay is going to tell you what that policy is going to cost you. And so the cost of the insurance is dependent on the nature of your business and the risks and the amount of insurance that you want to have and the amount of deductible that you're, you're going to maintain. And again, even if you don't form an entity, you should consider having insurance. It's a deductible expense for you. So there's that, but I, I can't, Again, even if you think you're in a low risk business and it's relatively small dollar volume, the insurance is going to be pretty cheap in that context. But the last thing you want, especially in our kind of litigious society today, is to get that complaint in the mail or served on you. And you have to respond and you probably have to have a lawyer do that. And you don't have any insurance because that's that's not a comfortable position to be in. Again, even if you've done everything right, somebody can still make wacky claims against you that you have to resolve in court. Uh, For some reason, this is right. Oh, there we go. So there are three basic. This is where we're going to probably spend the most time on, which is on leg three of the of the our little three-legged stool. And that's the the types of risk and how you can deal with them in your your interaction with your clients or with, uh, with your vendors, people who are providing goods or services to you. And so again, thinking about this structurally or architecturally, I want you to think about the three basic types of risk that have come from a contract. So now I guess I've got three legs on my school stool and three legs of of risk here. So the first is the risks that you can control. If you're uh, a chiropractor, you can control how you deliver your service to your clients. If you're a plumber, you can control how well you do your job and how well you, you know, provide that service. If you're selling a good or a product, you can control the quality of that. And you can control everything up to the point that it's put in the hands of either the next distributor or the end user. On the other hand, there are risks that the other party can control. For example, you deliver, you're hired to provide a piece of a bigger project, or you're hired to deliver a chapter in a bigger book or something, and your piece of the product or your intellectual property contribution or whatever it might be 
is going to be handed off to the uh, to your client who's going to have the right to uh, perhaps modify that or combine it with other things that they're bringing in from other sources. Let's say you manufacture a one ingredient of a cosmetic and the, the uh, company that's making the cosmetic is bringing in other ingredients. Well, the decision to combine ingredients or combine your work with another work of other parties is the decision of the other party. And so that's a risk that they can control and they need to take responsibility for that. And then of course, as we know from COVID most recently, there's risks that neither party can control. That's called typically force majeure, uh, acts of government, ac epidemics, uh, you know, injuries to you as a deliverer. And again, there are insurance policies that cover if key people aren't available to do their job, you can insure that risk as well. But if you think about it, I want you to think about those kind of three buckets, because when we get into talking about contract language, you really want to be asking yourself, is this contract language explaining assigning risk or liability or, or uh, uh, responsibility to me for things that I can control? Or is the other party trying to make me be responsible for things that I couldn't prevent if, if I wanted to. Let's see. Oh, no, I don't seem to be able to. Oh, there we go. So those of you that have contracts, I if you have written contracts, let me just say, I think I'll mention this later, but I worked with a colleague of mine, John Ballinger, to create a suite of uh, template legal agreements, you know, goods and services, hiring independent contractors to, you know, deliver services to you, contracts with your clients that can, you know, form a, a basis that address these terms and uh, form a basis and a structure for you to think about not only how to discuss your scope of work and so on, which is a form of addressing risk, but also these uh, legal issues that we're going to talk about in more detail. So there are several terms we're going to talk about here. And I, again, we can't probably dig into all of them as deeply as we'd might, but I think you need to be careful when you're signing contracts, particularly ones if, you, if you're lucky and you have a big corporate client, there's, you know, sometimes they'll issue an invoice or they'll issue their stock form and They'll send you something with uh, liability terms and indemnification terms that we're going to talk about in six point font. And, you know, you didn't go to law school. You don't you want to get the job because it's very lucrative or it's an important opportunity. And so you tend to gloss over that stuff. So I want to at least make you aware of what some of those terms may mean and how you want to think about them in the context of you know, the value of the job and so on. So basically, we're going to talk about these in two contexts. One is the scope and limits of each party's liability. Again, what are you responsible for? What are you in, in the position to control? What are they responsible for and what the what no one can be responsible for? And then the other one is agreed upon limits of your financial liability, or if they're providing goods and services to you, their financial responsibility. So you can see we're starting to create a little uh, kind of structure here of, of how to think about these. Oh, for some reason this doesn't. Oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but here we go. So we're going to only talk, obviously, in the commercial context, and I'm, I'm going to roll commercial agreements and commercial leases, which is just a form of a business contract where you're either providing commercial real estate or having commercial real estate provided to you. So it's a business contract. And so the, the first step um, that you want to think about, and we break these out in our templates, is you know, 
who's going to pay for some of these goods and services? You agree to create a product. And uh, the first question that comes up is who's going to pay to get it to the customer, right? Is that on your cost? And if so, uh, do you, are you going to uh, build that, that expense into your cost so that you don't end up cutting into your profit margins? Another issue that comes up routinely, particularly in, in services work, is a change in the scope of work. You know, you're, you're building a house, you're even sometimes delivering a product like, again, something that's to be included in a bigger item, and the customer changes their mind, but you bid your, uh, your service or your product with a set of expectations, and those change. So you need to be able to go back and include a term in the contract that says, first off, here's what we're agreeing to. This is our scope of work. These are my deliverables, and these my, this is my time frame. Uh, to deliver those, but also if there is a change in your needs or expectations, how are we going to address that? And then as, a, as kind of a special carve out, if you're in the business, if you're a writer, if you're an artist and you're selling your content, um, even if you're creating software, the question is who owns that work product? Are you giving them ownership of it? Is there a license that you're giving them to... Uh, to use it, uh, whatever you're creating. So these are some terms, again, that these templates are designed here to uh, to address for you. Um, and uh, so, you know, reach out to John or to me or to Teresa. And if you have more in-depth uh, questionings, some of the more complicated stuff, and frankly, this is where even I sometimes, I looked at a clause the other day that must have been, I don't know, almost a page long. And it, it, it was, I think there were two sentences in the whole page and it was almost impossible to understand what the other side was trying to say about who was responsible for what and what the, what would happen and so on. Um, so these can be very complicated. They can be sometimes by design, extremely hard to read, but two I want to talk about in a, in a little detail here are, um, the indemnification clause and what a warranty or a representation is. So a, a warranty in general is your promise to your client, or if you're the client, your vendor's promise to you about the quality of the product, uh, the ownership, certainly in the IP context, they if they're delivering intellectual property to you, that they own what they're able to deliver, so typically these are the things that uh, we're going to get into in the next slides, I think. But the the idea here, again, referencing back to our structure, is that you're only going to want to take responsibility for something that you're in the position to control or that is out of the control of either party. And you need to be careful that this language assigns risk based, based on who's in that position to to control it. I wish I knew what. And Teresa, I'm wondering, I don't, for some reason, the, up oh, there it is. Every time I call your name out, it goes away. So contract terms that address these three sources of risk, as I talked about, I want, we're going to go through them in, in more detail here. So maybe let me just move to the, to the next slide again. Um, I can. Oh, okay. So now I seem to be going backwards here, Teresa. Oh. Uh, well, here we go. For some okay. reason, this moved us forward. So. Again, with your scope of work, we always suggest that people divide the contract into a scope of work, which tells the your client or the person who's providing goods or services to you what you've agreed to, when you're going to, uh, when it's going to be delivered, what the payment schedule is, what approvements approvals are required, 
if there are change orders, how you're going to address those. And those are going to be terms that are specific to each engagement. Okay. So the, uh, when you, we tell people negotiate your scope of work first, because that's really what both sides are really interested in. And then the second part, which we're going to talk about next uh, is going to be kind of the legal and business terms in the boilerplate. But the key is specific, uh, particularly with the scope of work, you want to hammer that, nail that down as well as you can, because that's really where your, your profit margins are going to uh, rise or fall. If it ends up on a flat fee job that it takes much more time because the client keeps changing their mind about what they wanted, you need to be able to assert your change order in the scope of work to say, look, here's what we agreed to. I understand you want something else and I'll tell you what that's going to cost, but you can't have a client that keeps just changing their mind, you know, without you getting compensated for that. So now we're going to get into the uh, more nitty gritty here. So a lot of times you'll see, you may see this in your contracts to your, your clients, or you may want to put these in your contracts with your vendors, people that are delivering goods or services to you. But a warranty is a, is a contractual promise that the service or product will be, or the product will be formed to a certain standard or that the product will meet the specifications. And those go back to the scope of work. So you want to make sure that warranties are kind of consistent with what you've agreed to. And that when people talk about the level of performance, you want to think of terms like good and workmanlike and so on. Um, that So you really want to make sure that you're not promising that this will be of absolutely perfect quality. Things can happen and you're not you're not in a position to take responsibility for every every risk or any potential flaw. And people make mistakes sometimes. And, you know, we're going to talk about that a little more in the context of indemnification and limitations of liability. But, you know, people do make mistakes. And certainly if you're creating intellectual property, um, you want to avoid a clause that says, warrants in an absolute way that your work will not infringe the rights of the parties. You want to use a phrase like to the best of my knowledge or something, because you're not their insurer either, either your client. And certainly you want those vendors to, to stand behind their work, but the, the client that's buying anything, but particularly intellectual property needs to have its own insurance about their business risks. And we don't want them to push those risks on to you uh, that they should be carrying. So now comes indemnification. And again, these can be extremely complex, uh, you know, one long sentence with a million subordinated cl subordinate clauses and just can be crazy. But I'm going to try to explain to you in, in general terms what an indemnification is hoping to do, which is basically to in the context of who's responsible for what risk, the indemnification clause is the clause that should start with the premise that it's going to uh, make you indemnify, and I'll talk about what that means, which is basically pay the other party's losses arising from your failure to do what you promised to do. OK, now, excluding if you can't do it because of force majeure or some third party like an epidemic or a hurricane or something. But basically, when you are thinking about your scope of work and any warranties that you're making about the quality of the goods or services, your indemnification clause should be consistent and say, as long as I do what I promised the way I promised it, and consistent with any warranties or promises I made about quality, I'll stand behind my uh, my promises related to those things, and I will indemnify you for those. And what that means is 
you're going to agree with the other side that you will pay for their losses uh, subject to certain limitations um, if, if you don't do basically what you said you were going to do in the contract. So again, I hope you're seeing that this is all kind of of a piece and that um, when, you, when you're negotiating the, that scope of work in those terms, that's really what's going to set up the discussion about your indemnity clause. So when you when you see these, this is you know where the, the lawyer's uh, dream come true comes in. They often have a laundry list of potential damages. So again, without going into too much detail, the most obvious type of damages are direct damages. You say that you're going to deliver something on time, uh, so that they can incorporate it into a product and put that product out in the market you fail to do that or you don't deliver the product in the form that you agreed to do it and they can't sell their product and so they don't make sales. So that's a direct damage, right? Or somebody is injured because you uh, were delivering a personal service and you personally injured somebody. You know, you're, in, you're hired to deliver an educational seminar and you sexually harass one of the attendees or something. But then there's a long list of other damages, consequential, exemplary. You did such a bad job that the state thinks you should be punished with treble damages and so on. And you want to limit those to the extent that you can. There's a, we're going to talk about another way to limit those or two more ways. But you don't you want to try to limit your damages to direct damages, you know, because very creative lawyers, you could have a $10 direct damage claim, but a million dollar consequential claim. It's like the old children's rhyme about, you know, the want of a nail, the horse was lost for one of the horse, the kingdom, you know, the king was lost. And for one of the kingdom, the king, the kingdom was lost. So, you know, we don't want to go down and down that causality chain like that. The second thing, and we talked about this a little before, is that indemnification clauses address what level of wrongful behavior triggers your obligations as the indemnifier. Of the, and simple negligence, a simple failure of your uh, duties shouldn't lead to more than con contract damages. You know, you shouldn't have to indemnify the other party, pay for their costs of litigation or so on, because mistakes happen. And, you know, that's why we I encourage you to think about a higher standard, if you can get it, where your negligence is willful or gross, which means, you know, any moron should have realized you were making a mistake or that you kind of intentionally ignored your obligations or obviously the highest one is where you intentionally do something wrong. If you, in, God forbid, intentionally uh, interact improperly with, with one of their customers or somebody that's at a workshop or a child in their care or so on. But the higher you can get with these adjectives to negligence or behavior, the less risk you're going to, you're going to take on. Um, so once you've decided, again, who's responsible for what kind of risk, how they're going to uh, respond to that in the context of what you're going to indemnify them for, and as importantly, maybe what you're not going to indemnify them for, the next step is to talk about your monetary limitations. And the, the simplest way to think about that is if you, if you have a let's say you're doing a kitchen rehab, you know, uh, for $20,000. You, you don't want to take on liability if the whole house burns down, um, unless you uh, were grossly negligent, you know, in some way you, if you were doing the wiring, you, you know, did something completely outside of code or so on. So you, 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 you want your risk as a first factor to be somewhat in line with your, um, you know, the size of the job and what it means to you. So 
Um, again, step one is, as we talk about with insurance, if you've got a million dollar policy, you want never to accept any kind of indemnification liability that exceeds your insurance. So a lot of times, certainly with bigger companies and bigger jobs, they're going to ask, they're going to require you to carry certain amounts of insurance and to name that company as an additional insured. But you want to make sure that none of your risk exceeds what you're insured for. And that's why that insurance is so important, even if you don't have your 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 entity and you're operating as a solo a solo entrepreneur. Um, let's see here. As, okay, so I've, I've mentioned that. Another way to deal with thinking about your risk in the context of the work is to sometimes say a multiple. You can say, you know, any anything I do for you, regardless of my uh, level of negligence or gross negligence or intentional behavior, is going to be limited to uh, the amount of fees that you've paid, the amount under the contract, or some multiple of that. So again, you're you're capping your your monetary liability by contract, so that you're not uh, subject to some crazy claim that you could never have envisioned. Uh, you know that, and again, if you've limited it to direct damages, it, you do even more. So again, what we're trying to do is is build that uh, suit of armor kind of around you through contract. To limit it. So again, don't take on a million dollars of liability on a thousand dollar job. And you know, the real reality is the the bigger your customer, or sometimes even the bigger your provider, the less flexibility they're gonna have. But you can you should always try because certainly if you're dealing with a the power imbalance of, of negotiating with a bigger entity they're going to have plenty of legal resources to come after you. And so you, you want to just fight as hard as you can in the early stages to limit that. And we've had some pretty good success. We had a, cust a client not long ago who was negotiating with one of the major Ivy League universities in this area. And they had the standard clause, you know, you're responsible to us if the, if it snows too much or, basically anything. And we were really able to limit that. And they were pretty responsive in a way to limit the risk in a way that was uh, addressed what she was able to control and what, what a fair likelihood of damages was in the context of the service that she was going to deliver. So always push back on those if you can. And again, if you have specific questions, uh, you can always reach out to John or me and we will try to answer those. Um, so let's see. So if there's no questions on those, I'm going to move to some dispute resolution issues. I don't, Teresa, how are we doing for time here? Uh, we're down to 15 minutes. Okay. I think that's going to work perfect. So dispute resolution, <laughs> as I say here, the, the best form of dispute resolution is dispute prevention. So the key to dispute prevention is a clear and comprehensive contract. That, that's why we always emphasize a, a detailed scope of work. I, we get so many clients coming in on both sides where th their client or somebody they were going to do something to, they're upset, but they, they were both in such a hurry or didn't think it was important to detail who is going to do what and when they were going to get paid, but, and now they're fighting. And you say, well, what's the contract say? And it basically says nothing. So we, we created these templates as a way to not make you have to recreate the wheel every time. But, you know, when you're closing an engagement or a deal with a client, you know, you want to be bulleting what that scope of work is going to look like. And nail that down with them, even though it feels like it's getting in the way of getting started on the job, perhaps, um, because that way it'll never come back to haunt you. So the contract form, the things we've talked about in terms of limitations of liability, kind of the legal boilerplate side, that's those are critical elements of dispute prevention. 
if you, but you also want to have in a, in a contract, um, how you're going to resolve your disputes. And we'll talk about this in a little, little detail, but generally you have two paths for anything other than mediation. Um, one is arbitration which is a little more expensive because you have to pay the arbitrator, but it's much quicker. And then the second is going to the courts, which is cheaper, but a lot slower. I mean, you know, very few pay, uh, cases actually go to trial, but it, it can still, it takes a long time for the courts to act. It takes a long time to be heard on the various legal motions that, take place. So, you know, on a, even a simple kind of contract claim, I had one that we ultimately settled it, but we were almost three years into it and had never even, uh, we weren't even close to trial at that point. So again, much cheaper, and but you have to factor in the cost of your lawyer. Those transactional costs are much higher, even in court. And it's, if it's a significant dispute, you're not going to do it on your own. And so another step to kind of uh, head it off if you can, which I find very useful in a lot of cases, is to consider a mediation clause that would uh, go in prior to, to your uh, decision making. So th the differences are that mediation is a voluntary process. A neutral party comes in. A lot of the courts, certainly in Massachusetts, I'm in, we had a dispute. We were subject to a bench trial on, uh, on Monday and we got up there, excuse me. And the other side said, I'm not sure I, I really want to litigate this. So we asked the judge and they hooked us up with a, a court uh, sponsored mediator. It's free. Um, and they're usually pretty good. Sometimes they can help. They're not, um, you can leave mediation at any time. The discussions are confidential. They can't be, even offers that you make during mediation are, can't be introduced as evidence, but they are non-binding. So, you know, a good mediator can sometimes help you come all the way to closure. They can help you narrow the number of issues. You can agree on some and, you know, have a much narrower set of issues that you're going to take to uh, a third party binding uh, decision making. So those those two options there, and ones you want to think about having in your contract, these are third parties who are neutral, whether the court or the arbitrator. Um, in an arbitration, you're hiring someone. Uh, often it's a former judge or uh, industry expert, depending on what you're arbitrating, because they know the ins and outs, or a former lawyer or something, or a current lawyer. And you're going to, both sides will present their evidence. Uh, they'll, it looks like a trial in many respects. And then the arbitrator is going to make a binding decision that's non-appealable, even if you think they're wrong. So when you, when you go to arbitration, uh, you want to be careful, and we'll talk about this in litigation too, that you are specifying that the arbitration is going to apply the laws of your state, if applicable, if you've got contracts in your Massachusetts and there in Rhode Island or whatever, you always want your contracts to say the law of your state is going to apply even regardless of where you're performing the good or the work or the, or providing the good, if you can. Um, you want to beware of a clause if they're suggesting it that requires the loser in an arbitration to pay for attorney's fees because there are very few uh, cases in litigation that allow for attorney's fees. So don't add that burden in if you can avoid it. Um, and also make sure that you agree that the arbitration will take place in your state. Again, if you're, if you're working all over the country, you don't, you can't or certainly don't want to have to go to Idaho to uh, to arbitrate a case. So those are some common kind of bullet points you want to you want to be on the lookout for. Um, litigation always also leads to a binding outcome. Uh, again, I the last number I saw was something like 85 or 90 percent of all civil cases settle before trial. 
Um, again, the, the costs of using the quarter low for attorney's fees can be significant, which is again, a factor that you want to consider uh, in your insurance to make sure that they're going to cover costs of defense for certain insured claims uh, that again, you want to make sure those insured claims are kind of claims that are most likely going to arise from the performance of your service or the delivery of the product that you've agreed to. It's a slower process in a bench trial, which means you're just before a judge. The judge acts as the uh, finder of the rules on the law, but it's also the finder of fact. So in a bench trial, there's no jury. Um, and if, if you're in, in a kind of field where you worry that uh, people may be swayed by sympathy for the other side or something, a bench trial is a better way to go. This case I was talking to you about, it's the uh, defendant is, is a much older person and she likes to come into court in her wheelchair and, you know, she looks like she's just not going to be around much longer. And in a jury trial that, you know, might have some sway, but a, a judge is not going to be swayed by that. So if your claims are below a certain amount in Massachusetts, and every state has a variation on this, I think the number is $7,500 in uh, is the cap on small claims. You can go in yourself. I mean, you can go into any court yourself, but it gets risky if you get into the district or the superior court. But in small claims, they're really there for people to come in on their own. And, um, you know, you can make those claims. It's a simple filing process. Um, and you you go in and you tell your story. Oftentimes it's to a, a clerk magistrate. It's not even to a judge. And very often they try to sit you down and get you to mediate it right there on the spot. Uh, but you can get your judgment or um, so on if you take it all the way. A lot of times people don't even show up to defend those. So you have a collections issue maybe, but it is a, a viable way to go if you're comfortable doing that. Um, again, as with arbitration, if you, if you choose to litigate, you want to make sure it's applying the law of your state all the it, the disputes are going to be exclusively in your state's courts. Uh, so again, this is limiting your expenses of, of, of dispute resolution. Okay, so I think I've come to the end here. If Unless you have any questions, my kind of final thoughts are reach out to John. There's his email and maybe Teresa put that in the chat as well. Um, or, or Teresa, you're always, I'm always happy to try to help you to the extent that we can without acting as your attorney, but there are resources. And, um, you know, I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, I guess we have a few minutes left. So uh, let me know. Otherwise, I want to thank you for coming and, you know, reach out to us if we can help you. Uh, I did have one question that was posted earlier. I, I did save it because um, I know you'll talk about it briefly when we do um, business entities, but I did have a question about incorporating in another state mm -hmm. uh, outside of um, Mass you know, Massachusetts. Yeah. And I, can you address that really quick? Yes. So the, if you want, there's, if you're going to be located in another state and, doing business there, then you can uh, just register yourself there initially. If you have a business in Massachusetts, but you decide you're going to set up another office or also be doing business, let's say in Connecticut, then what you do is you maintain your Massachusetts business and you register as what's called a foreign entity in Connecticut. So you could, and you can really just Google, uh, if you're just going to that state, go to NOLO and put in uh, set up LLC in Connecticut, let's say. Um, and you can also just Google uh, set up foreign entity in Connecticut, let's say. And their, their little step-by-steps are usually impeccable. So that's how that would work. 
Okay. Uh, I don't have any other questions posted. Good. Well, so. again, thanks for coming. And, okay. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Thanks, okay. Teresa. Thanks, Bill. Yep. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.